Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. The first time ever on the show after 13 years, we finally got Steve Hackett. Hi there. Guitarist extraordinaire. You know, his solo work with Genesis, GTR, and it goes on and on and on forever. It's a pleasure to have you, Steve. Uh, for me, Great you're part of, you. you're Great one of the most unsung heroes I find. You know, like you should be. A household name like Eddie Van Halen. That's how I look at you. Oh, well, there we go. Um, yeah, well, um, I love Eddie's playing. You know, that was great. And um, he credited me with an influence. That's good enough for me, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I think a lot of guitarists, guitarists are usually very generous with each other and have met influences. And um, I think perhaps drummers are more competitive. I've... I've <laughs> It's more, of a, it's more aggressive. Hey, it's more aggressive. You want to work with him? You want to work with me because... <laughs> <laughs> it's so, a, so a different world. Let's start off right at the top, okay? You know, you're yeah, you're coming yeah. on tour. You're coming on tour. Yep. It's yep. a Foxtrot at 40 plus your solo material, correct? Uh, well, 50, actually. It's Foxtrot oh, at 50. So we're out by a few years there. But uh, if you wanted to... Uh, uh, I don't mind. You can take years off my life. That'll be good. I like it. I like that. I should I get like my calculator idea. next time I do this. Okay. So <laughs> Fox tried at 50 plus your solo material. Tell everybody what to expect in terms who have not seen your show yet. Uh, just tell everybody what they can expect to, as the tour starts in Montreal on October okay. the 3rd. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Fox Trot is a Genesis album from 1972 originally. So it's it's not just 50 years ago. It's 50 years plus because of COVID catch up. We're still doing that. We haven't taken the uh, this show to North America yet. We have played it extensively in, in Europe, Scandinavia, um, other places in the world. And finally, we get to take it to Canada. We get to take it to America. Um, and uh, I think it's one of Genesis classic albums. Uh, of a certain era. There are two that are my favorites. I think Foxtrot and Selling England are my, my two favorites of the ones I did during my time with Genesis with Peter Gabriel. You know, the, and then there's a couple with Phil Collins when he took over on vocals that I did afterwards. Uh, but um, I, I think it's, it's a classic. And the version that my band did at Brighton in the UK, um, it's it's gorgeous. It it looks and sounds wonderful, and um, it's an I think it's an absolute classic. If you like, if you liked early Genesis, if you liked what we now think of as progressive stuff, although we didn't know at the time that was what we were going to be uh, called, um, then I think I think it's a must for music that's detailed and um, at times complex complicated but then the um the style of music is pan genre it, it ranges from uh, uh sci-fi to social comment to humor uh many things it's most of the most of the of the uh, the songs are stories they tend not to be uh, boy meets girl it <laughs> tends to be more complicated than that but hey you know aliens like, invasion alien invasion alien and maybe invasion, a little bit yeah, of us you know it's, you, you know it. the book of revelations or somewhat of that yeah, right yeah exactly yeah yeah boy meets girl meets revelations meets uh, meets the beast okay i got you the beast um, yeah that's right yeah yeah hanging out with the beast man we could have called it that <laughs> here's the question it, it seems to be you are the only I would say former Genesis member that's still keeping that era of Genesis alive. We'll call it yes. the Peter Gabriel era, right? Yes, yes. There's a reason why I think it's a there's a it's an aberration that the others don't. But I think the band became something else later on, post Peter Gabriel or or, or post MTV, should we say? Yeah. Um, but. I'm talking about music from an era when John Lennon gave us a name check and said he considered Genesis to be true sons of the Beatles. And I'm very, very proud of that. And it's this era that he was talking about. So um, you can hear that influence. If you hear Willow Farm in the middle of Supper's Ready, Great Long Peace, 
you can hear Beatles all over it. Let's be honest. It's, it, it is really son of walrus, if it's anything. So Willow Farm, uh, walrus farm, indeed. It's kind of circus music in a way. You know, it's cartoon music. It's, it's parody. It's, it's send up. There's a kind of vaudeville tradition that it's drawn from as well. It's I, I think that, that word of vaudeville is a very good way to explain it or give that image of what that music is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, um, uh, so it's um, it defies description really, but um, the stuff on Foxtrot is is um, it's very wide ranging. There's a lot of different styles. As I say, pan genre is is how I see it. It's inclusive music. There's so many styles that were being um uh hinted at on on that album uh so i i think the original sounds good but i think the live version that i've done you know 50 years plus later with my band i think it sounds better because we can play it better it's more in time it's more in tune these guys are virtuosos were genesis at that time were a young band struggling to be able to keep up with the ideas that the entire team were able to come up with together so uh yeah and you can say oh yeah well that's sacrilege and shoot me down in flames but hey you know until you've heard what this sounds like in its entirety which genesis did not do genesis never did foxtrot in its entirety some songs were considered to be too difficult or um insufficiently uh audience worthy but now with the passing of time the fact that it's been um, come to be regarded as, as, a, as a classic all the songs past muster even the little quiet ones um stuff like timetable and horizons um they've all found their place um you know when you're a young band there are different priorities of course you know audiences haven't heard of you best foot forward do all the loud songs blah 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 blah, blah. but those subtleties of course could be brought into it all these decades later so I, I think it's a really good uh, so line. so well explained and i would i would also agree with you that so what i do i'm a fan of genesis especially the gabriel era i i watched some clips on youtube when when, when peter was fronting the band yeah doing supper's ready doing a timetable or i can't remember what's on, what from that from foxtrot era yeah and then i watched your performances of the same songs you know a few years back with your band, yeah. Yeah. you've taken it to another level. Like you've kept the essence of the classic sound, but you've updated the uh, sound experience and the visual experience. And I think you've done a fabulous job. But, and I'm not just saying that. I, anyone could attest, anyone who watches can attest to this. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I, I think um, it was always difficult music to put it across. You know, you were stretching the audience's patience uh, you know, great long pieces. It's the opposite of what radio-friendly music is all about. I mean, it's... <laughs> but, complete but opposite. It's, it's the complete opposite. But, but then it's 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 an experiment. Yes. And, and no one's saying that that you can't do it. It's, um, it's just that I don't think bands sound like that anymore. Um, so, but that doesn't make it an anachronism. It just means that... Um, there's a different emphasis now. I, I think that the music changed when, when the 1980s happened. It seemed to me as if everyone was trying to get on, on the right side of everyone wanted to be an MTV's friend. And mm -hmm. uh, albums tended to become collections. I'm not saying in every case, but they tended to become collections of potential hit singles. You know, I know this stuff. You're only as good as your last hit single and all of that. And everybody felt that pressure. But we're way beyond that now. And um, as as a good friend said to me fairly recently, and he's a very well-known singer, he said, uh, we're too old to be pop stars. And <laughs> absolutely right. Don't confuse um you know, someone my age with a, a pop star, you can you cannot do it. You cannot do it credibly. You can't. You've got to do what you do best and uh, and and stick to it. And if that turns people on, wonderful, wonderful. And and if it, it if it means that um, radio turns a blind eye or a blind ear to it, 
that's entirely expected. So we're back to a time when music functioned by word of mouth or by uh, social media, which is basically extended friends. But you can always go and check it out. You can check out YouTube. You can check out all the rest. It's There's masses of it out there. Uh, and I just keep going with what I think is the best music. Um, and that includes solo stuff as well. Uh, mm. So with this show, not only is there Foxtrot, there's also, um, I can't remember if it's 40 minutes, 50 minutes, or an hour of solo stuff. But that's, first of all, some of that stuff I did with Genesis in the first place. Um, so, you know, there's at least three tunes that I did with the band. So it's another... It's another sort of, if if not, and then there were three, it's another sort of, uh, it's another trio that could have gone that way and indeed did for my first solo outing. Uh, so I think it's got a lot to offer. It's it's a really great show. If I may say so, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And, um, Good. And you should be. And you should be. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your guitar work. Okay. You talked about Eddie Van Halen at the start. Yeah. Let's, let's just clear this up. For the people who yep. don't know you, yeah. the uh, finger tapping, the hammer ons, this is something you yep. were doing. And I know you've been asked this question, you know, many, many yep. times, but let's just clarify yep. this. Yep. You're doing the hammer ons, the finger tapping, and you could see that in Supper's Ready. You can see that yep. in uh, the musical box. You can yep. see, if, if you watch your show or watch any visuals, that you're actually doing yep. what Eddie Van Halen was doing, sort of like at a, at a sort of a, a starting point for Eddie, I guess. He yes. just took it to yep. another level. So tell me about That's that. It. Well, it, it's prototype tapping, um, yeah. the technique that I did and that he named. Um, that's something that I was doing from 1971 onwards. You can hear it on Nursery Crime, as you say, Musical Box. You can hear it on, on um, uh, uh, Return of the Giant Hogweed on the same album. You can hear it on uh, another another album, Selling England by the Pound, the first track, Dancing with the Moonlit Night. Yes, yes, when we absolutely. Were inducted when we were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, uh, the band Fish, they were talking about that, about the guitar solo. So the first thing that gets talked about was was that guitar solo, which included sweet picking, tapping, and octave jumps, which all of which I think, you know, it's all part of the glossary of terms. Uh, you know, no, no heavy metal guitarist would be, you know, they wouldn't want to be seen dead without being able to do all of those things. Um, you're going to look at all those things because it's all part of part of the language of that, and it's not just delinquent, you know, guitar playing, even at its most aggressive, and certainly in the hands of Reddy, who you were talking about, you know, it's very it's very accomplished, it's very thought about. You know, you can't you can't blister through all those those salvos without putting in the time. It's not just a couple of power chords and well, hey. Here we go. It's um, it takes time to do all that, all that stuff. It's did, only part of it, though. Yeah, yeah. Did so. So you're doing this in seventy two, seventy three on stage. Was there? So just to clarify, was there ever a point where Eddie Van Halen acknowledged you in person, or he just in print? He said, "Oh, I really like I think what." It's 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 in print or it's in uh, 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 interviews that he gave, and uh, I've never met him, which is a great great wow. thing. Um, but I would have liked to have. He worked with my friend Brian May, another guitarist of extraordinary distinction. Uh, they had worked together, um, so and I worked with Brian on on a couple of things. So I think it it might have been a natural um, sequence of events that. Eddie and I may have done something together at some point. I certainly did stuff with Steve Howe, and I've been working recently on stuff with, I've noticed your T-shirt, with Steve Rothery. So, um, yeah, he mentioned you. Steve Rothery and I have got something in the uh, in the pipeline as well. So there's lots of stuff to come, as well as, you know, the stuff in the past. And just, just going off on a tangent, when GTR yep. sort of fell apart, yep. is it – how much truth was it that you're kind of working with Brian May from Queen sort of to pick up the pieces on GTR or at least start a new project? Well, I've decided that, you know, that for me, GTR would come to the end of its, of its shelf life. And, um, uh, I was, I'd started a, a solo project and Brian May became involved. Uh, we were talking about doing a double header 
um, his commitments made that difficult to pull off. So it became another solo thing for me, as opposed to a successor to GTR. But um, it, it's semantics, really. Um, but we did some nice stuff together. Brian's a, a, a great, great player, as you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And another another Brit, of course. And he's come up with, uh, he and his father came up with a wonderful uh, a guitar design. Uh, and I, I've got one of those, one of his red specials. Um, and it sounds just like Brian. It's got that upper harmonic thing. It's got that sort of, that sort of sound. So, um, I guess, you know, we can all end up impersonating each other if, if we want, uh, it all depends, uh, you know, how far down that route do you want to go? But, you know, it, not just as a guitarist, but as an inventor, as a, as a craftsman, you know, he has that. And, uh, and also scientific qualifications, too. So I'm happy to sing <laughs> That's phrases right. of, That's of right. That's august others. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just want to go back to the Eddie Van Halen thing. So I, yeah. I spoke to Chris Holmes, who's a guitarist of Wasp, who's good friends with Eddie Van Halen. He told right. me, he said that Canned Heat, I think it's Harvey Mandel from Canned Heat, was doing finger right. tapping at that same era. Whereas right. he learned, and then Terry, I can't remember his last name, but Terry Kilg Kilgore, learned it from yep. him, then he right. kind of taught it to Eddie Van Halen. But right. at the same time, he saw you doing it and he saw right. Jimmy Page doing it. So he sort of right. took all those influences and created well, something new. But as I say, you know, it was 1971. Um, yeah. I was oh, doing yeah. that on, on, on electric. Um, it's, um, it's a moot point. I believe that... Um, I believe that it was being done on an acoustic guitar, although I only found out that yeah. latterly, um, earlier still, uh, as, a, as a classical technique and a way of doing all sorts of things, trills. The sky's the limit. Basically, it's a way of playing very fast. Let's, let's just, you know. I, I think it, the beauty, the beauty of your, the, you always play to the song. That's the beauty of your guitar solos and your guitar work. You're always playing to the... Uh, sort of the intensity or the dynamic of the song and you just don't overdo the tapping or you just you just you're all over you know you're, you you're playing to the emotion of the song always i find well funny enough it's something that phil collins said about songs he said you know you've got to do the right thing for the particular song that you're doing with i'm paraphrasing him here but um um you know he could have spent his time being billy cobham on everything but that wouldn't have, have fitted um, that wouldn't have fitted all those songs that he did subsequently. So you take something from here, you take it from there, and uh, uh, it comes out as you in the end. Each each of these people <clears throat> contribute something. None of us yeah, invented yeah. music. That's uh, right. We all heard it when we were kids. We became fan of it, and um, and the muse has stayed with us. Yeah, Whether yeah. you're in body or you're in spirit, and I do believe people live on, and sometimes their effect can be even more powerful when yeah. they've passed. I mean, look at the late, great um, Jeff Beck. Um, mm. uh, who amongst us has not been influenced by Jeff Beck every time he's picked up a guitar and put some echo and distortion on it? Never mind feedback, finger vibrato, and... You know, pinched harmonics and so many things and the melodic sense. So um, I guess I'm from a long line of, of guitarists. I'm, I'm standing on the head or rather on the shoulders of giants or perhaps, you know, it's all a footnote to the greatness of of others. And I'll, I'll include um, Andre Segovia in that as well. So we haven't mentioned Segovia. We haven't mentioned Jimi Hendrix but they all gave something unique to the guitar. And um, we're all, I think, modest in their own way. The era between, so you played with Gabriel and his sort of his, uh, his three or four, was it four or five albums that he was on. And then you played with Phil Collins as the Phil Collins led Genesis in the prog yeah. era, we'll call it. Yeah. What do you find were the, the the pros and cons of each era like when you played with peter led genesis versus a phil collins led genesis what were the, what were the highlights and maybe the down sides of both those eras well i think you know people tend to feel that 
if there's a singer, it's a lead singer, then you know he's responsible for everything. But Genesis was a songwriter's collective. So the fact that we survived Peter's departure um, was important. That was. It wasn't just a case of you've got the sort of the Jagger Richard thing that they write it all and that's how it is, or, or ELO where it's basically one guy. You've got you've got something else. You've got a team putting it together. So the teamwork is important. The stuff we did with Pete was, I think, extremely important. Um, really, really clever, marvelous lyrical ideas, um, and I think his sense of theatricality. Uh, rivaled Alice Cooper at times. Once he embraced that totally, what that means is that um, an audience that might have walked out during an earlier era of complicated music, when you had visuals to accompany it, that made a, a big difference. So production values, the show itself, that's what really makes the difference. And so, you know, you hope that if you're in a band like Genesis, you're going to survive the departure of your lead singer. You hope that you're going to survive the departure of or leaving the group, as I did. But what survives is is the quality of the music. So I figure it's, for me, it's whatever Genesis started out as and whatever they became, whatever we became, they became, um, it's putting the fire back into Genesis. As far as I'm concerned, Genesis became very fiery at one point it started out um 50 50 acoustic and as a band it became very hard edged indeed um so i think you've got to take it at at its best you've got to say okay this is where i got on board what do i love about genesis yes i love watch of the skies okay that's pete's era yes i love dance on a volcano of los endos that's phil collins era but it's the whole band putting that stuff together. There's a band with no passengers. Um, that's what you've got to search for. You know, seek out and destroy. You've got to do that. You've got to have a band where people have all got their intense desire to do it, and they've all got to have their own muse as well. You've got to just, you've got to have that. You've got to have that fire because otherwise, if it doesn't catch fire for you guys and, in rehearsal, he isn't going to catch fire in front of an audience. At what point did you say, you know, after a few albums with Phil Collins led, did you say, you know what, this is just not for me, or maybe you you felt like the input, you weren't given as much input in the band, or what, what, what was going through your mind in terms well, of leaving? I think, you know, I, I joined a band that was uh, uh, a democracy, a songwriter's collective. Um, I left a band that was becoming a dictatorship. And I think that that, when I was told by Mike and Tony that I could no longer do solo work, um, I, the hackles rose there because they also wanted to control who was writing the songs. And that wasn't the basis that I joined the band on. So uh, great band, probably the best band in the world. But at the end of the day, you can't keep a good hack it down. So you've got to, <laughs> you've got to be true to yourself, your muse, your um, that small voice that says, "Well, what if?" You know. And I'd done Acolyte, and it had been a hit. It had been a success. Um, I've had these conversations with with uh, with other people who've left left bands and gone on to do extraordinary things. Um, You've just got to accept this is the way it is. You know, talk to Rick Wakeman. It's you can function within a band, but then uh, you get to outgrow the group unless the group is prepared to be relaxed enough to let everyone do solo work. And uh, I think once a band starts to lose, once it starts to lose people, uh, you know, it lost Peter Gabriel, it lost me, similar sort of circumstances in, in well, terms of. of of, of being told that you can't have a parallel solo career, blah, 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 all of that. And you figure, well, why not? Because it would have strengthened the band. And of course, the great poetic justice at the end of the day was that Phil Collins' solo career outpaced the band in terms of, 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 of sales. So um, I think um, uh, I think that's ironic justice 
for them. Um, but 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 there we are. You know, I still love the guys in the band. Uh, it's different now. We're all very much older, and I think that uh, I think there would have been a rethink if anyone had been sensible enough. Frankly, you know, why would you want to lose? Uh, a singer of the quality of Peter Gabriel, you know, great, great performer, writer, humanitarian, all of that. Um, uh, you know, you have to allow people room to grow. You you can't run a band by thinking that, that you own people. You can't run it like that. You know, you can't suppress. When, when you were hired, when you were when things. you joined when you joined the band, were you a yeah. a member, an equal member, yes. or were you just a hired gun? No, I was I was a fully fledged equal member. That's what I joined. Uh, that's how I I joined on the understanding that there would be that. You know, I I joined on the understanding that there would be a mellotron. I joined on the understanding that there would be a light show. That we would work towards these things. I joined on the understanding that we would get uh, a synthesizer. I joined on the understanding that we would become more than uh, a folk singing band all these things that now the band surpassed my intentions and desires for it incredibly you know by the time we were doing uh arenas every night and filling three nights in london's uh, earl's court eighteen thousand people a night um uh, i felt you know job done now i've got to see what i can do on my own and of course the lakeway richie havens happened to be on the bill that we we asked him to join us. We became pals. We then went on to work together with his keyboard player at the time, Dave LeBolt. And um, it's, it's very interesting. Dave went on to work with, with David Bowie. Um, um, and Richie went on, funnily enough, to work with um, Peter Gabriel on a project called The Story of Olvo, which was a concept album that was designed for the uh, Millennium Dome in, in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richie said to me, um, yeah, Peter phoned me up and said, well, I got this song. I was going to sing it myself, but I figured you might do a better job to him. <laughs> so this was a compliment played to, you know, um, paid to uh, the late, great Richie Havens. Um, and, you know, what a voice, what power. And on the same album, I got to work with um, uh, Randy Crawford, um, many other extraordinary people. Uh, Steve Walsh, I worked with the Kansas guys. Uh, so I was really into, um, at that time, uh, everything I was doing on, 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 on the album that I, that I did as soon as I left, which was Please Don't Touch, was I thought, why don't we do a kind of personal compilation album? Every song should be at a, at a tangent to everything else so that from one song to the next, you don't recognize the same team. It has to be fluid. Mm. It's a, I guess it's a, a songwriter's thing and a, and a producer's thing more than a Guitar Heroes album. Um, they, they want to have some sort of consistency. That's what it is, the producers, right? Well, that, that, that's it. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's variety. I think was its its strength. Um, according to Tony Stratton Smith, who was the label boss of, of uh, Charisma, you know, he said um, something about its 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 strength. You know, its extraordinary variety is its strength, and also its weakness. He, he felt, you know, the fact that perhaps it wasn't stylistically in one direction. Don't forget, the era had arrived where rumors was considered to be the perfect album for any band to do, but it was Fair almost right. recognizable immediately from the first track to the last, that there was a sense of focus about it when those guys were a young band. Um, and we liked what they were doing too. Yeah. Let me ask you this. With the sure. exception of 1982, the reunion of Genesis, what were the hurdles, that burning question for all Genesis fans, the Hackett fans, the Gabriel fans, the yeah. Bill Collins, what were yep. always the hurdles of reuniting again? I could see now it might be a little too late in the game yep. for Phil Collins and some yep. other members, but what uh, were those hurdles? Okay, it's it's um, the extreme competitiveness at the core of the band. 
And I think there's always been this idea that, oh, well, if we let these guys back in again, you know, um, this is going to be seen as the real band, whereas the real band, uh, we want it to be seen as a three-man team. Uh, at one point, we all had a meeting. My God, this is right back in, I think, is it 2005? It's a long time ago. But anyway, nearly 20 years ago, we were having a meeting going, um, and can we make Lamb Lies Down on Broadway the thing that we will all do together and um, can we do it as a musical is that possible can we use avatars the word came up even then you know uh, um, uh, way before um the uh you know the stuff with abba um it was it was extraordinary but there's competitiveness that wrote you know um that's the problem it's i remember we, you know we had this meeting in glasgow where phil was doing a gig and um, uh, straight away, Tony said, I think that it, it won't work. It won't work as, as a musical. It's, it's too complicated. Well, if it had worked, it would have changed the shape of musicals. Uh, if Queen could do it, then I think yeah. that Genesis could do it. But it's um, maybe too much power to Pete, you know, because Pete very much wrote the story, not the music. We all wrote the music, but... Um, you know, the idea of of relinquishing that amount of power and reflected glory was just a little too much for the guys who were holding the name. Sadly, because I think Genesis was capable and is capable of, of much, much more. But you're quite right that Phil is not, I suspect, in a position to be able to do more Genesis or more solo stuff. Although yeah. maybe, maybe there'll be a miracle and... Um, and that will all change, but it's been much publicised that that was the end of Genesis. Whereas for me, for all sorts of reasons, I feel as though I'm just starting out. I always feel like I'm just starting out, and that's well. I got to uh, say, you it. you you breathe life into your solo material. You breathe new life into the Genesis material, and congrats to you. Um, what about future albums? Or what are you, are you working on? Any new material? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on one at the moment. We're just doing, well, actually, it's, as we speaking downstairs in my house, um, Roger King's working on the 5.1 surround of a new album. Um, so we've done the, the stereo mix. We've done, done the surround. Um, I shouldn't be talking about this because publicists hate me talking about future projects. <laughs> so, yeah, you should be talking about the Fox Troy 50 oh, and, and, and nothing else. But, but. You know, uh, I, I work in something. It'll be out, I guess, in the early part of, of next year. I don't think that's going to stop anyone buying Foxtrot if that's, you know, if you're interested, I suspect I'm, I'm, I'm in encore time, aren't I? Let's face it, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. <laughs> All right, so there you have it. Uh, Foxtrot at 50 and Hackett Highlights live starting i said what october is that it october the third starting in montreal going through toronto into the new york and uh, the rest of north america that's very exciting yep. i'm happy you are doing very well um is there anything you'd like to uh, mention before we uh leave well i probably let the cat out of the bag of too many things already but uh <laughs> um, i uh, i'm still making a noise for a living is what i say the thing that unites all musicians the one thing you can say about them is that they, you know, they all make a noise for a living. And uh, and I think it's a privilege to do that. It was always a passion. It was a hobby. It was many things. It's been a constant friend to me. And I, I've been very lucky. Um, uh, most of the parts of my body are all still working, including <laughs> the fingers. <laughs> when the brain gets clogged up, I just let the muscles do the talking. Uh yeah, it's it's been great so far, and uh, I've been very very lucky. I've been touring everywhere relentlessly. In fact, um, uh, I'm looking forward to this tour coming up, and also uh, next year as well. I do like the touring life. I have to say, although it's you know it's tough on the uh, on the hours of sleep. Um, Is Lamb you know, lies I, down on Broadway next? As your full well, album, what I, what I, what I'll do is I'm not going to do it in its entirety. So any tribute band out there wants to do it in its entirety, 
Go ahead, guys. Um, what I'll do is I'll do some selections from it that I that I relate to and I think work best and things where the guitar's got something to say in it. And um, I do really like certain parts of, of the lamb and other things I, I don't feel so drawn to. So I'll, um, I'll leave those behind. So I'll leave it to the completists if there's any tribute band out there. Best of the Lamb Lies oh, yeah. Down on Broadway. There's best oops, of, yeah. oops. Good. We just mentioned something good. else. Oops. That's good. No, best of sounds very good. I like I like the idea. Best of sounds. Best of the lamb. Good. Best, the best of, the of the lamb. lamb. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I'm there's some, something 50. that you could say, but it might upset the vegetarians, you know, lamb <laughs> cutlets. So we can't um, we can't yeah. say that. We yeah, don't yeah, want yeah, to, yeah. to do veggie that. lambs. Yeah. So absolutely amazing. Yes. What year was this was this released in seventy four? I don't remember. It was originally 74, whether it came out in 74 or 75. I think it's out in 74. Um, I remember we were touring it before it was released, and we were touring it. I think we started out in Chicago, and no, no one had had a note of this. So anyone who showed up expecting all their favorites at that point was sadly disappointed. Audiences broke out into fistfights <laughs> at the time, I seem to recall. It was absolute sheer mayhem but um because i was looking at the tour dates you stuck to our guns sorry from from foxtrot sorry to cut you off from foxtrot you're yeah. playing big theaters and then when you hit lamb yeah. actually yeah. selling england by the pound to lamb you started playing the arenas at least in north america i mean well um i tend to think that we were probably playing clubs and colleges first of all and then it became theaters of course there's a smattering of theaters in there it became, in, in my mind, it became arenas round about the time of Trick of the Tail when we had Bill Bruford in the band. But, of course, we were still playing a fair amount of theatres. So theatres were necessary, uh, arenas where possible. Um, and it, it's funny, you know, I've just done South America and just played in Argentina to 5,000 people in a in a boxing. I don't know if you can call it a stadium, but the thing just went on for miles. Um, might have been five there, might have been more. In Katowice, in Poland, we were playing uh, an arena, this same stuff. Um, it probably never got played in arenas during its day, not in its entirety, as I say. So this is a chance to see uh, you know, that album in its entirety, if you liked anything that Genesis did in the early days, I would say this is something that, that would probably, uh, you know, be a, I think of it as, as, as a milestone. Now I, now I look back on it, you know, mm -hmm. when you're young, you're just hoping that your, 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 your record contract gets renewed. Um, but who would have thought that, you know, 50 years plus later, it would still not just of sprouted legs, but wings. And it just seems to um, appeal, I think, to all those disenfranchised fans who thought of Genesis as, as a very fiery band yeah. once live. And it's a chance to get that, get that again. And it's loud. Well, when Peter, actually, this is my last question. When Peter Gabriel left the band, the band was in debt. Did yes. they recover? And yeah. when you left the band, was the band still in debt or you recovered from that debt? I think yeah. the band was always was always in debt for as long as I can remember it. Um, I think we were on some uh, questionable deals in those days. Um, and overheads were high. Uh, it was a band that didn't stint on its live production. Fortunately, we were in a position to be bankrolled at that time, usually by the record company. But... Um, uh, yes, I know, you know, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, disappointingly at that time, having toured it for nine months pretty relentlessly, uh, I remember we were owing, my God, what was it? Something like quarter of a million pounds, never mind dollars, and it would have been two to one in those days. So we were in the hole for about a half a million dollars at that time. How is it possible to keep going at that rate? But... Uh, we did. did maybe the record company told you you were you you owed us money, but in fact they were making all the money and they were just kind of well, like moving stuff around, right? 
I, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, there's never been any problem with money in the music business ever before, has there? It's always been an, <laughs> the immaculate conception. So, that's uh, right. That's you know, right. Especially for the artists. Would, They're always first paid. Yeah. Would that, you know, would, it, would that be the case? Uh, Spotify doesn't pay much, but I shouldn't really be talking about that, you know. No, no. Uh, the publicist's nightmare. Hey, you know, uh, music has been very good to me. I've made a very good living at it. I've been allowed to do it. I was able to give up several really boring day jobs in order to do it. Uh, and uh, I haven't looked back since then. You know what? That's a great note to end the interview. I appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you in Montreal. And Thank you, you know what? Best of luck to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to talk to you, Jimmy. All nice to talk to you, too. Thank you, too. Bye.